Okay. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm really excited. We are here for our very first session exploring this book, The Evolving Self by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. I believe is the, <laughs> the closest I'm going to get to pronouncing this name correctly. And usually we just call him MC out of love and affection and ease. If many of you have joined us before, we did a whole series on his original book about the concept of flow, and this is a sequel in his thoughts. So this is our very first session, and Moritz and I prepared a presentation for you to take us through chapter one here. And just so you know, then we're going to do breakout sessions and then also bring everybody back to the room for takeaways and questions, and we'll be ending by 9 p.m. Easter tonight. But let's get started with the book. Are you not seeing it move? Um, I'm just seeing the first page. Hmm, that's not good. Why didn't it move? It was working before. Do you not see it? I'm still just seeing the title page. It's very strange. Oh, okay, wait, 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 wait. No, no, I see it. <laughs> hmm. Okay. No, I think I we're may on... have to swap. No, no, no I, I'm I think... gonna swap my network. Okay, we're on the uh, we're on the next page though. I think. Want to just stay here? So yes. the, first, the first slide we have for you today really is just a recap of the first book for those of you who may not have been able to join us for that book. We just wanted to start with a definition of flow from that book. He describes flow as the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people will do it even at great cost. Flow is when you're so invested that you lose track of time, you lose your sense of self, action and awareness seem to merge. And there's also an important concept that we talk about, the challenge skills balance. Flow happens when your skill level matches the challenge and the difficulty of the task. And then you're in what we consider the sweet spot of the flow channel. So you're not in boredom or in anxiety, but just that perfect spot where your skills meet the challenges. And one idea about flow is that it is in itself an evolving process, because if you only have so many skills, like you, you could imagine, let's say you were going to learn something new, like playing piano. So when you would first start out, those introductory exercises would be really difficult for you. And there probably wouldn't take much for your skills to match the challenges. But after a little bit of practice, you would just get bored playing the I don't know what the first songs might be, but you know, you, you're, you would enter into that boredom phase. So you would have to start working on developing your skills just to get back into that sweet spot. So there's an evolution with flow. And now we're gonna start to bring this idea to think about the evolving self, how flow fits in both with our evolutionary past and our potential future as human beings. Can we get to the next slide, Maritza? Hold on a second. Sorry, guys, my computer's misbehaving. Well, I guess while you're doing that, I'll just maybe provide a little bit of a brief introduction to what the book is going to be all about. So, oh, maybe we're here at the next. Yes. Are you oh, at? Okay, um, perfect. Excellent. At chapter one. Yes. yes. Sorry, so guys. Chapter one. So chapter one is called The Mind and History, and we're starting out with the perspective of evolution. And the major point here is that shaping the future course of evolution is not something that can be accomplished by solitary individuals working alone. 
Therefore, it is necessary to consider which social institutions are most likely to sponsor positive evolutionary actions and how we can develop more of them. This is the broad scope of what this book shall explore. So in this book, he's going to situate flow and the self and the human experience within evolution and then make this point that the future of evolution is something that we can control. And that's what this book is going to explore and, and have us ask questions about to think about how can we be active in evolving the human species. And um, so, for example, he makes the point that what we are today is the result of the forces that acted upon our ancestors, but what humankind will be in the future will depend on what we do today. And then he says here, in order to make choices that will lead to a better future, it helps to be aware of the forces at work in evolution. It is through them we will succeed and fail as a species. So that's how we're starting out this book is even to just lay out this groundwork here and then start this exploration of what are the evolutionary forces that have acted upon us. So then we can start thinking about how we can actually take those forces into our control. Did you want to say more about this section of the chapter here? Maritza? Um, just here, I, I'm, this is like the perfect setup for us. You know, it's, we start here, um, and I just wanna point out to you that here, we're starting by being reminded that um, choices are key. And that's all I'm gonna say for now. We'll get more into it as we progress. And I did just want to point out, I really like this last point that you had here on the slide. Like this to me, it got me thinking that he, he makes this point that evolution has built into us certain narrow interests, right? To eat, to reproduce, things that you might say are very narrowly focused just on the one individual. But when we start thinking about taking control of the direction of evolution, it's about transcending those narrow interests and you know, thinking about our interests in a wider sense that also involves collaborating with other people so that we, we create a better future for everyone, I, I believe. I'm going to go to the next slide here. Oh. All right, so yes, yeah, so the next section we're here with the global network. The main point here is that our actions will affect everyone living on the planet and we will be affected by theirs. And he had some really interesting anecdotes of how he went to these communities that seemed like they were very isolated and cut off from the rest of the world, but so he was writing this book in the late 90s at the at the turn of the third millennium, as he points out. But it's interesting to me that I found even some of the insights are perhaps even more true and more relevant, uh, you know, all these decades later now. Um, and I think this is certainly even more true now with just the way that we are connected globally through the Internet and, you know, what didn't even exist back then, that clearly it's the case that you know, as a species, we are all connected. And you can't just think about your own destiny without taking into account the world as a whole and, and beyond even just the, the planet. As, you know, as, as Elon Musk says, we're becoming an interplanetary species. So even just thinking about how our actions reverberate you know, much wider than our own local area. You know, I, in this chapter, I mean, this section here, I love this section because it's very near and dear to some of my own personal thoughts and the idea that, you know, everything you touch is touching someone else or something else that's invaluable. Um, I love that. So after the statement, our actions will affect everyone living on the planet and we will be affected by theirs. We're reminded that it is together that we shall either prevail or disappear. So we're looking at the evolving self so this right here is painting that very vivid picture for you. And we're gonna get into this more as we move along, but I'm gonna very early on now start pointing out to you that even though the book is called The Evolving Self, the focus is going to be not the self alone, the self within a community, within a culture, within a world, within the earth. 
Yeah. And I'll just put out, I think there's a good point that you have here at the bottom of this slide too, that, you know, connecting this back even to consciousness, because when we're talking about flow, we're, we're talking about, you know, an experience that, that is you know, primarily in the consciousness and then also within the body, it is something that is of the self. And he makes this point that you know, our consciousnesses have not yet evolved for the problems ahead, but he wants to make an argument, and this is part of what we're going to explore, that if we, we delve into how human psychology has evolved and developed, especially in response to rapid changes, it can help make us better prepared to direct and control the rapid changes that we are going to experience as humanity continues to evolve. Um, I just want to just very quickly, I know that we just threw conscious, the word consciousness here mm -hmm. in our new, but um, we, um, so when MC speaks of consciousness, he's speaking more of the inner workings of your brain. And, and actually a little bit further on, he's going to go into a little more detail on what he means when he says the word consciousness. Mm -hmm. So just to let you know, don't be confused. It will be explained. So the next section of this chapter was called At the Hinges of the New Millennium, because as I pointed out, this was written in the late 90s. So here his main point is becoming an active conscious, here's that word again, conscious part of the evolutionary process is the best way to give meaning to our lives at the present point in time and to enjoy each moment along the way. I think this is here where we're really even starting to connect it with the idea of flow. So flow he had defined and described as the psychology of optimal experience. It was all about how to create a happy life. And so now we're going to connect these ideas with being part of the evolutionary process. And I like this, this um, point you have here at the top um, where he suggests that we should all begin our explorations into this topic with being curious about the meaning of life, questioning whether the existing explanations are exhaustive enough and being concerned about the state of the world. I just thought that even just gave us, I thought it just even a really beautiful framework for the mindset that we can adopt as we begin this, to value curiosity, to, I, I like even this phrase that the existing explanations might not yet be exhaustive enough, which isn't to suggest that there aren't valuable truths and gems within the existing explanations, but that you know, building on those existing explanations, there is still more that we can find and discover and learn and develop. And so if we have that curiosity and that concern about the world and that willingness to accept that, hey, we might not know everything and there's more to learn here, that, that's, that gives us a, a good foundation to get started on this quest. You know, I wrote in the margins for this section here, right around where um, we're talking about becoming an active conscious part of the evolutionary process, I wrote, living with intention. <laughs> um, so there's that word again, my favorite word from the flow book, intention. Here, let's add to it the word we were introduced to in the first slide, intentional choice, intentional choices. The majority of this book, I believe, and I have not yet previously read the book, I'm walking through this book with the rest of you together. But my initial thoughts are that this is going to be the focus. How do we walk that meaningful path, looking for our flow states, using the best intentional choices that we can conceive, not just for ourselves, for ourselves and our communities. Thank you. Ready to go to the next one? So our next section was called chance, necessity, and what was it? Oh, something else. Okay. So here the main point was breaking out of the fatalistic acceptance of genetic or historical programming requires, at the very least, a belief in freedom and self-determination. A person is unlikely to take risks and work for the common good 
unless he or she believes that it will make a difference. So here we're really going to explore the idea or at least begin to, I mean, really this whole chapter is him just kind of laying the groundwork for the book, but we're at least bringing up the idea of free will, connecting this again to that important concept of choice and how choice is going to be necessary. And we have to embrace the reality of choice is what I hear him saying to really make the most of this project to, to evolve ourselves. Um, and and he, there, there's this one line here where he says, if everyone submits to the determining forces of causality, it is unlikely that humankind will survive. However, if enough people were to believe that the future is at least partly in their hands, the prospect of survival would be greatly enhanced, for then they would be much more likely to take steps to avoid the cataclysm. And I think there's even a lot that we can explore here. Like I, I even love that it, it already perhaps even starts to give us suggestions of things that we can do um, you know, to, to help people realize that at least the future is partly in their hands so that they become interested in being active agents of evolving humanity and making the species and the world better. This um, section was so rich that I really struggled. I, I want, there's so much more I wanted to get on here. Um, this is, talking to us about the power, the powerful um, aspects of shift in perspectives, which several of you have heard us speak about in other um, discussions. And also here, there's a very strong call for accepting responsibility for the design of our earth, of our communities, our cultures, which I find to be fascinating. Um, the, and here it's, it's also, so in this section, he spends the very first part speaking about, you know, how our views have changed, how, you know, even something so small as a butterfly flapping its wings, you know, he's talking about the butterfly, the butterfly effect, right? And he, and, and that takes us back to the concept we've already been introduced to where it's impossible for us to find anywhere where we are not affecting someone or something. And he goes and he gives us some different um, examples. And what he talks about is that it has become fashionable to claim that individual action has no significant effect, effect on history. He believes that's a dangerous route. That path is the path towards stagnation and apathy. And because I am of the mind that the flow state is a path and for it to be a path whereupon we must be walking on it, I'm of a mind if anything is being accused of being stagnant, then it's not the right way or not maybe right is the incorrect word, but it is a matter of we're seeking to walk that meaningful path if we're not moving, then we're not improving. Um, funny thing, my I, I do these exercises online, and the the um, instructor's favorite thing to say, motion is lotion. I curse her out in between <laughs> all the stuff she has me doing, but that there is important here. If you stop and you if you decide you will do nothing because you are making zero impact. It, it goes against this, if everyone submits that, you know, you may think oh, I'm just gonna stop, nobody's gonna notice. Sure, they may not notice if you stop, but what if I also stop and Joya stops and DL stops and Wayne and Nizzy and everyone stops? Well, then it's a spiraling out of control situation. That's the caution that we're being warned about, I believe in this section. One more point here too that, that I just think is profound and, and I think connects with lots of other topics we've been discussing in 52 Living Ideas, like the Design Way and Louis Sullivan, and we're doing the Fountainhead series now. He, he has this point where he talks about how truly creative individuals are those who succeed against all pressures of both instinct and worldly wisdom in visualizing a way of life that will um, make, the, make the lot of others freer and happier. And so just, just again, kind of this 
point of kind of encouraging us all to find this creativity within ourselves, to go beyond just what uh, the, the instinctual forces from evolution may have provided us, beyond just what the world currently status quo seems to say, and to be active in visualizing a way of living that will make all human beings, including ourselves, happier and freer. The next section of this chapter was a question, are we hopelessly bad? <laughs> Here the major point is, you and I are part of the process of evolution. We are bundles of energy programmed to pursue selfish ends, not for our own sake, but to preserve and replicate the information encoded in our genes. It says here, throughout the past, people more often characterized their times by a conflicted, even tragic view of mankind's destiny. And a rosy colored picture, he points out, of human nature can't stand up to scrutiny for long. Um, but I, I, like we should point out here, as we become more aware of the motives that shape our actions, as our place in the chain of evolution becomes clearer, we must find a meaningful and binding plan that will protect us and the rest of life from the consequence of what we have wrought. So here he's pointing out that, you know, clearly there has been tragedy, if not outright evil, in the past of humanity. But just because of that, he still puts out this vision of the possibility that by understanding how we fit into the evolutionary chain, by choosing to focus on how we can evolve and grow and develop both as ourselves and as a species, that we do have this choice to rise above any of the, the tragedies that we as a species have caused in the past. Here, um, you know, this question, I, I am not a fan of the question. I don't like the title of this section, I'm not gonna lie to you. Are we hopelessly bad? So I don't believe that very many things are inherently good or bad. Um, we mold it, we do the molding. The good or bad is shaped by actions. So we can, again, take our intentional choice and actively work towards moving away from what would be perceived as a bad in trying to seek what might be perceived as the good. Um, but honestly, I don't think that it's as necessary to focus so much on those concepts of good or bad, preferably if we focus on walking that meaningful path, I think that would help us ensure that we're not falling towards the wrong side, as it were. Um, I do, so it's, there's a um, one little saying, he actually paraphrased it from somebody else, but I like that he says, he, he's talking about, um, whereas if one starts from the assumption that humans are basically weak and disoriented creatures thrown by chance into a leading role at the center of the planetary stage without a script and without rehearsal, then the picture of what we have accomplished is not so bleak. Paraphrasing what the trainer said about his talking dog, the point is not that we sing well, but that we sing at all. And I think that's the optimistic perspective here. You know, it's, and again, change your perspective. If you are viewing everything as bad, maybe you should change your perspective because there's, there's gotta be some good there. The very, I don't believe that anything is, is either or. Like, I really think that we, would benefit from embracing more often the yes and, or you know both. I, I, there, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I just don't, and I see that interwoven in everything that is stated in this section. I'll share too. I, I I agree with your uh, frustration with the title, and I would have even preferred if this was called "Are We Hopelessly Bad?" or automatically good. Because one of the things I even got from this section of the chapter, I heard him saying that 
we really want to avoid the false extremes in both directions. We don't want to think that human beings are just by default hopelessly bad. But he's also pointing out that, you know, like he, he gave the example of like new age movements. And then there's others who just almost take the Pollyanna view that we are just, I guess you could say, hopelessly good. And both of those extremes are wrong. And that, that's what, you know, what I got from this section that we want to find, I believe, this way of moving forward without falling into the excesses of either false alternative. So the next section is called the good and the bad, which maybe is getting us more toward, toward uh, the, the path here. It, and, and it is a kind of yes and, as, as uh, Maritza pointed out. So here the main point is the only value that all human beings can readily share is the continuation of life on earth. In this one goal, all individual self-interests are united. This I thought was a really even just provocative. I, I had to stop and just even like think about this, like is, is, is this really true? And I think there's a, a lot to, to ponder here, but he's proposing this idea that the a value and a goal that we can all share is the value and goal of life on earth. And that could be just a way of thinking about how, how to unite us. Um, and then it kind of says at the bottom, like the goals and values we now have are appropriate to a species blindly struggling along with other species in the stream of life. They are appropriate to passengers, not to navigators. But whether we like it or not, we are now the pilots of spaceship Earth. For this role, we need a new set of instructions, new values and goals by which to steer a course among the many unprecedented dangers. And so I guess when we, you know, one of the things that we can in this group start to think about is, uh, you know, what, what we think about this idea of, um, you know, sharing this goal of the continuation of life on Earth. Another interesting thing here is that he tells us that this is an adventure of the mind. Um, and that, and not only is it an adventure, it's of the mind, it's one it's a, you know, it's a unity to be had here between the self and the community. But he emphasizes that the first stage takes us to reflect on what or who each of us is individually, which it, I think that's a brilliant concept. I really do, it's something I've been saying and I do so love to see other people actually putting it in black and white here, this idea that the path towards building a strong community and a strong culture lies within first ensuring we have strong individuals. Uh, and now we're gonna get to the, uh, the, the topic of the book, the, the idea of the evolving self. Now we are getting to the emergence of the self. And the major point here is the fate of humanity in the next millennium, which is our millennium, depends so closely on the kind of selves that we will succeed in creating. Evolution is by no means guaranteed. No task is more essential in the long run than finding a way to develop selves that will support evolution. And here he points out that entropy is the supreme law of the universe, but it is not the only law. Creation and growth are the requisite opposites of death and decay. So here we're gonna think about how can we overcome entropy through creation and growth. And I think we're gonna have a lot to explore here, but he, again, here is just kind of laying this as a, a groundwork for us and a foundation for us to start our exploration throughout the rest of this book. Right. This was a, another section where there was just so much that more I could have probably come up with you know, two or three slides here. It was very hard to keep it at one. The, um, so he, he says to us that evolution is forced on us by the fact that systems fall apart with time unless they become more efficient. We can't stop and remain in the same place. Even to remain, we must advance. And that's, to me, that's just a solidification of what we've been saying in some of the previous sections, the need for, you know, movement. Standing still is not going to do anything. I love here that it's pointing out that, you know, we must move, or else, oh, because we we have to fight entropy. There's there's just 
you have two options, right? So um, you, you let it win or you try to win. And so I, I really, I really appreciate seeing it stated in a few different ways because it's, um, it's just a fascinating concept. Um, for me, something here that I also think is very important is the second to last bullet where it says, having a self-reflective consciousness allows us to write our own programs for action and make decisions for which no genetic instructions existed before. That's another way of saying we're designing our path forward because we're creating, you know, that which does not yet exist. But you guys have heard, I'm cheating a little bit. I'm stealing that from the design way. But um, when you look at that statement for its own self, it's, what is it doing? It's another way of reminding us about moving with intention. And it's also, I like self-reflective consciousness because it's reminding us also that while we have a consciousness, it does bear merit for us to reflect upon those things within it. The, the idea of not just floating along, it's the idea of moving with intention. If you are being self-reflective, you are taking the time, the moment, to think upon what is in your consciousness, as opposed to just letting it flow in and out of your consciousness and let the chips land where they will. Um, so speaking of consciousness, he does get a little more into this, as promised, right? He gets more into this concept of consciousness and he, attract, he attempts to define a little bit more what he believes he, or what, not what he believes, what he is saying when he speaks of consciousness. So that's why this last bullet is here for you. He tells us that consciousness is more like a magnetic field, incorrectly spelled, sorry, a magnetic field, an aura or a harmonic tone resulting from a myriad separate sensations collecting in the brain. So he's looking at consciousness from more of a neurologic perspective as opposed to a spiritual perspective. And Joya, did you want to comment on that aspect there? I'm just going to uh, reinforce what you said, that that phrase about self-reflective consciousness. Uh, when I was reading through it, so I, I think I shared before, this is my first time reading through this book. I'm, I'm reading it for the first time with you all. And when I got to that phrase in the book, that was one where I just had to like stop and underline it and pause and just think about it. I guess there's maybe an irony that I had to stop and be self-reflective about the idea of self-reflective consciousness. But that struck me too, is just a, such an important identification of what it is to be human, what makes human beings so special, and even what it is, as you're suggesting, that gives us this power to actually have this agency and control over what evolution could be. The fact that we have this self-reflective consciousness. Absolutely. Um, this is a such an important um, point that I'm going to read a little bit here from the book for you, because mm -hmm. um, I just really, it's very important here. And we are talking about the evolving self, right? The emergence of the self. So here it emerges. And as we walk forward together, reading this book, we're going to see how perhaps we can help it evolve. So it, he's speaking a little bit about different, he's, he, talk, he says the self, like other living things, will use energy from its environment to stop entropy from destroying it. Naturally, right? So that's one of the bullet points here. And he goes on and gives a couple examples, you know, Christian martyrs, Stalin, and he's talking about these selves. And then he says, the fate of humanity in the next millennium depends so closely on the kinds of selves we will succeed in creating. Evolution is by no means guaranteed. Now that's what we're considering the major point here. What accompanies that is we have a chance of being part uh, I'm sorry, we have a chance of being part of it only as long as we understand our place in that gigantic field of force we call nature. Neither excessive humility nor trucolant bombast will serve us well in the future. If the selves of our children and their children become too timid, too conservative and retiring, 
and try to stop change by retreating into a safe cocoon, eventually they will be overcome by more vital life forms. On the other hand, if we just forge ahead blindly, taking what we can from one another and from the world around us, there is not going to be much left to enjoy on the planet. Whether life will continue on this world now depends on us. And whether we survive and preserve a life worth living depends on the kinds of selves we, were, we are able to create and on the social forms that we succeed in building. Certainly there are many momentous tasks looming ahead of these perilous times from saving the rainforest to protecting the ozone layer, from reducing the number of births to keeping those already born from tearing each other to pieces. And then he says that last major point, but no task is more essential in the long run than finding a way to develop selves that will support evolution. On this depend all other positive consequences. And the last line is definitely a go sit in a corner and ponder for a moment. He says in the last line of this chapter, if there is to be a history, our minds must be prepared to make it. That was beautiful. I'm glad you wanted to read all of that out. And, and I'll just underline here too, I think, this just gets back to your point again about how we kind of need this yes and approach. We, we don't want to be too humble and we don't want to be too bombastic, but we do want to be, I guess you could say, assertive in thinking about how we can take control of what our evolution will be. That is the last slide. Mm -hmm. Brings us to the end. So next, we are going to give you a question that you guys can discuss. We're going to give you 20 minutes in a small breakout room. And really, you can use the breakout room to maybe bring up anything from the, the chapter, from the presentation that you wanted to talk about. But we wanted to give you just a, a question to, to ponder and perhaps to get started uh, thinking about th this chapter. I think we're going to do the free will one. Did, did you want to yes. Did you want to give them the quote? Or I, I could look it up here. I have, I have it here, I think. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, it was, we just said page um, 15. All right. So for those of you reading along, I believe it's page 15. If not, but no worries, we're going to read it for you. Um, there's a quote here that says, the idea of free will is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Those who abide by it are liberated from the absolute determinism of external forces. That's the quote. And we've got a question coming at us from Joya. Yeah. And so the question really is just to, you know, what you even think about this, this suggestion that of free will being a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll say like, I, I had never, I, I thought a lot about free will. I've never thought about it in terms of being a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what the question is even, what do you think about that idea? Um, is free will a self-fulfilling prophecy? Would it make a difference if in fact it is? And, and how could it be that those who perhaps do accept and abide by free will are liberated from determinism, that just by accepting free will is what gives you that freedom from a, a totally deterministic universe. Anything you wanted to add there, Maritza? No, I think, I think you did a great job and that's, that's a frames the topic for what we're going to discuss, lovely. All right, so I'm going to put you all here into breakout rooms for the next 20 minutes. And again, you know, you can talk about this question, uh, you know, anything else perhaps that you want to, to bring out from the chapter. And then after the breakout rooms, we are going to come back together as a big group and talk about any takeaways, any questions you have, anything from the chapter that you want to discuss. So I will be starting the breakout rooms now. Thank you guys for getting your invites.
raise their hand or type exclamation in the chat to pose a question. All right, Joe's got his hand raised. We always count on Joe to come up with a good question. I'm hoping if it's a good question. I'm trying to uh, look for the quote. Uh, oh, there it's, um, yeah, what does it mean to be on this, uh, to be on spaceship Earth, essentially, where he's saying that we uh, need a new set of instructions for, you know, for this, for globally, and how to, like, what does he actually mean by that? And I think that would be an interesting question to pose to the group. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, because I, I there are some thoughts that I have, but uh, like related to Buckminster Fuller, but I would like to see what maybe mm -hmm. how he differs from, say, uh, from his perspective on the world. No, I had the same thought when, when he suddenly said like spaceship Earth. I was like, oh, like, is this like suddenly become a, a Buckminster Fuller reference? Like, it seems like it came out of nowhere, too. So, yeah, it might be interesting to explore the connections that we can find between some of those ideas. All right, Joe, and then next up is DL has a question. Thank you, DLJ, actually. Um, DLJ, sorry. No, that's all right. Um, yeah, we, we had a great conversation in the group, but we talked mainly about the matrix, um, mm. creating your illusion, if you like. So belief in free will creates free will. It works when you buy into it, when people stop believing it, everything. Yeah. Anyway, so we had a great conversation about that. Um, I wanted to put, I wanted to get people, other groups' thoughts on something that popped into my head. Um, there's, a, there's an element that sounds a little bit like eugenics. Did anybody else discuss that in their groups? Um, it's the manipulation of the future through biology. There's little echoes of eugenics there, which made me slightly uncomfortable. Um, other people's thoughts on that? I'd welcome. Mm -hmm. Did, did you want to say a little bit more about where where, where you saw that little flavor of, of eugenics or? Oh, yeah, hang on. Let's see, I'm going to the notes. Um, early on. Positive evolutionary actions. So that was on slide. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean. Second slide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, after the title slide, second, yeah, third slide total. Uh, in the green writing, it says, "Yeah, therefore, it's necessary to consider which social institutions are most likely to sponsor positive evolutionary actions." Um, that's that's got echoes of eugenics there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah, okay. yeah, that could be. Add that one to the list. Ooh, wait, so um, I think Wayne is next, and then Laura, you can go right after Wayne, okay? Okay, uh, kind of following a DLJ, but taking a different direction. He's using the term evolution, and I'm just wondering, what does he mean by, I mean, he seems to be meaning more than just simple survival, the fittest of Darwin and such, but evolution as purpose, as having a goal, an, an intention, and uh, and that was a popular idea at one time, and then it became less popular. I mean, those of us who read a lot of Stephen Jay Gould I mean, saying evolution does not have a purpose at point, it just is. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, what is his view on evolution and what evidence is there for it? Yeah, good question, thank you. All right, and then Laura, I think, had something to say next. Did you want to bring up a question, Laura? Pose that. I mean, I think obviously, um, if, if there is certain movement, you know, that will occur involving human beings as they learn more, as they see more, as they do more, and that makes a change in the individual and the society as a whole would be, to my mind, evolution. So whatever you want to call it, I think it is sort of a natural occurrence in our universe, however you want to. So that's how I feel that, you know, for whatever you want to call it, it it's there. Um, so I don't know that we can deny that there's evolution. Um, the degree of which or how- Did you have you a know, question you want to? Oh, sorry. 
What did you have a, no, I was, a question that you wanted to put on the table yet? Uh, and then and then we will go through got, and, and go through I, and answer I, all the different questions. I got sort of distracted about this one. So I think the question okay. is, um, I guess the question is, um, um, what, how do we define when a society or an individual has evolved? Or are there markers that we will look toward to evaluate whether evolution has occurred? Mm -hmm. or someone has evolved mm -hmm. that's it great thank you thank you for the question <laughs> all right and that takes us right below the point where we're just starting to devolve <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see so anybody else have any other questions they want to put on the table here. Otherwise we can, I think maybe we'll start with, I think we can even kind of tie the last couple questions together here. Um, you know, what exactly does MC mean by evolution? Is he suggesting that evolution has a purpose? What is his, his definition? And then we can combine that with Laura's question to think about the, the signs and the markers. Anybody have any thoughts they wanted to share about, about the question? I'll start and again, you can, um, oh, sorry, are... I was going to say, oh, sorry. I was just going to jump and say, you can, uh, again, just raise your hand and type exclamation point in the chat if, if you'd like to share your thoughts on this question. Sorry, go ahead. Marissa. Yes, I'm going to, um, I'm going to start you guys off while you guys are percolating on the answers in your minds. Go ahead and, uh, type an exclamation or raise your hand if you wish to comment. But I'm gonna start with saying that, um, you know, I believe that the way that MC is viewing evolution is that A, he hasn't given us his entire absolute definition. We're going to walk through that together with him, the purpose of the book, right? Um, but evolution as he is presenting it to us in this very first chapter, is it's that forward movement. It's finding a way to improve us and us being the, the uppercase us, right? Through various means. Now that the means are not yet defined. So he doesn't have it pinpointed for us to that level. Um, he does use the word, so, so we're talking about what what is evolution? I'm gonna hold off on Joe's question because I just realized you didn't get to it yet. But the um, the the idea of you know he he talks about the perspective of evolution. So what he's asking us here is to take up the perspective of evolving ourselves and evolving or even evolution in many different forms is how he's presenting it. Um, the sticking point here for some of you is what are we talking about when we say the word evolution? I do believe that he's talking about the standard and I, I couldn't find it here, I apologize. I think he actually mentions this, but so, you know, evolution is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the earth. Right, that's just the basic definition of evolution. So what he's saying is that this gradual development from simple to more complex needs to continue. And I think that that's where he's getting at when he says um, evolution. So um, anyone else wants to chime in here with what they perceive to be the definition of evolution? I'll share, I, I had a very similar question as well. I was kind of hoping that somewhere in this first chapter, we were gonna get a definition of, you know, the book is called The Evolving Self. I was kind of hoping we were gonna just get a straightforward definition of this is what I mean by evolution. And obviously he did not give us that here. And, and as I mentioned, I, you know, I think both Maritz and I have not yet read this book. We're, we're walking through the book with you and reading it chapter by chapter. But my sense, even just from having read other works by MC and seeing how he's starting to lay this out, I think his, his view of what evolution is, is going to emerge as we 
delve deeply into this book. Um, but I think there is something interesting about this question of purpose, because clearly he wants to put forward the view that as human beings, we have choice. And you know, as, as he talks about, we have self-reflective consciousness, and that, that gives us the ability to be purposeful. So he clearly does seem to be suggesting that somehow we as human beings can be purposeful. Now, does that mean that he's going to say that evolution itself is purposeful? Um, I, 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 we, I haven't heard him say anything about that yet, but it, it does at least, he, he's putting forward this idea that I think is intriguing that as human beings, we can be purposeful and we can be purposeful about evolution. Evolution may just be, it is what it is, but as human beings, we perhaps have the ability to take that and, and transform it into something that will serve life on earth broadly is what he seems to be suggesting. But I think uh, it's gonna be a, a wait and see as we go through the book. Let's see. Anybody else wanna share? their thoughts on this particular question. Um, and I guess even the second part of the question too, if you have any, maybe you have thoughts about what mm -hmm. you think evolution is or ought to be. Um, and, and to uh, Laura's question there too, maybe what you would think would be signs that we have indeed evolved. Uh, let me see. So it looks like Anton um, wants to say something and then it looks like Laura wants to say something for her question here too, but we'll do Anton first. Oh, and yeah. then Wayne too, after Laura. I think, uh, and uh, I, I like that you uh, described uh, what consciousness is. Like the earlier, the question was asked, like consciousness in this context, what does it mean? So I like there's a description of consciousness in this context. So I think it's like, um, at least what I take from this, I, I haven't read this. I, I'm, I'm interested. I tell myself I should read. I'm interested in these subjects and I talk about them anyway. <laughs> so uh, some of what, some of some things that I would be saying anyway, but I think it's like evolution of consciousness is my impression of the information that's presented to me and what people are talking about. Like, um, so it could be like the basic definition, uh, which I think was a good definition that Maritza was just reading of evolution, but that also can include or expand uh, consciousness? How can we become socially more evolved? As an example, um, those are some thoughts that I have. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Anton. Next up, we have Laura and then Wayne. Laura, you're, you're up if you wanted to say anything about your question. You're still on mute there, Laura. Maybe we'll let we oh, there I, got you it. I got it. I got it. Okay. No, it's just when you were talking about that. I mean, today, you know, we sort of realized, you know, we have to, in order to build our society, we have to build communities and, you know, communities are we, and, you know, you don't have a we unless you have an I. So it takes a sense of part. People have to, the eye has to be evolved to a certain point that they can join together and form a we. So it may not be that everybody agrees on everything, but there's some level to which they've evolved that they can have a discourse that allows them you know, to grow. So that's all I wanted to say with regard to that. Um, and I, that may totally be nothing as maybe I misunderstood, but it seems to me that um, you know, we talk a lot about that, the I in, in the, ev the evolving, but I think there has to be more of a we to it also, you know, where there's a joining of forces. Yes, I, I would agree too. I, th I think it is interesting that the book is called The Evolving Self, but clearly it is the evolving self evolving with everyone else. So yeah, yeah. All right, Wayne is going to be next to chime in here. Oh, uh, thank you for your clarification. So he's not, that is, he's not really defined what he means by evolution uh, clearly in the first chapter or so, and no one else has read a full book yet to figure it out. So it, the idea is going to kind of evolve, uh, no pun intended. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting point that evolution may or may not have a point, but our purpose. But we're here right now 
as a product of 4 billion years of evolution? Where do we want it to go? Where do we want to go as a species, as, as people from here? And it's sort of like the French existentialists going, life has no meaning, so we have to give meaning to it ourselves. So I'll be interested to see how he develops it. I, I agree. I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see how he develops it. And it's interesting to me that he's already acknowledging that it's human beings who have self-reflective consciousness and who have purpose, but he already seems to be suggesting that it's, it's not going to be just human beings. It's going to be, you know, human beings may be the, the ones with purpose and directing it, but that what our goals ultimately need to be is something about, he, he talked about the continuation of life broadly. So I think, you know, he's going to suggest that there's something to do with, you know, beyond just humans and thinking about life on the planet mm -hmm. and perhaps throughout the universe as well as we learn more about the universe. Uh, Joe has got his hand. I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I'm, and I'm with everyone else here that I have not read the book, so I can't, I can only speculate as to what he means. Um, but it would appear that it has to do with purpose in some regard. And not only purpose, uh, it's also relates back to how we are connected to one another as well. Um, and how that relates to our purpose and our actions in and of itself. So essentially he did talk a little bit about the, um, how we were, a, uh, you mentioned a global kind of we need to look at ourselves in a global kind of as a community a global community and because I immediately thought of uh, how this is kind of just related to cosmopolitanism in general and and I think that that's maybe where he's going with our purpose where we create our own purpose and our and how we work with one another but how we discover ourselves in that process is also critical as well um, because once we understand ourselves then we can understand how we fit into the rest of humanity. That's just a thought, but I don't know. I have not read the book, so I can't. That's, I'm curious, do you have, have any thoughts about, oh, sorry. I, mean, I just want to follow up on Joe. Like, I'm curious, do you have any thoughts about maybe how the ideas of evolution, his or any ideas of evolution might uh, pertain to cosmopolitanism in general? Um, no, I mean, I, I think that, um, in the sense of that, how I can only think of it from in terms of how we are like where he mentioned that we're no longer um, interacting with ourselves, like interacting in a narrow sense that just for ourselves. Um, so I, the only way I can see this is kind of like a global citizen of the world. And it kind of gets to the question of what I was talking about with this idea of what he means by spaceship earth in general too. So then how do we set these values that we should all necessarily share in order to respect one another? But I, I can't, I, I don't know what he means by, what he would mean by cosmopolitanism uh, specifically, again, not having read the book. Yeah, so Maritza has something to say, and then I think we will go to your question about Spaceship Earth. Hey, I have uh, two things. First, just out of curiosity, I, I'm curious who, it did get a chance to read the first chapter. Just out of curiosity, if you did get a chance, just throw in um, yes into the chat. I'm just curious. It's not a, not a big deal, just out of curiosity. Um, second thing is, so, you know, another definition of evolution is that it's a process of gradual development in a particular situation or thing over a period of time. So the, if we look at that from kind of some of the, concepts that we've been introduced to here with MC, it does lead us to thinking that he's kind of looking at evolution as change. And he's, he, we started the very first section, right? When the very first section is called the perspective of evolution. And he, and the, the word focused upon in that section was choice. So I'm thinking that, the, that what we're going to be introduced to here as evolution is going to be the is going to heavily heavily include these concepts of choice and change. Um, that's going to be the focus that he takes for the book. Um, from the idea of so to address specifically um, um, Joe's question on well actually are we moving to that question, Joya? Sorry. 
we, we are moving to Joe's question. So go yes. ahead and okay. offer your answer. So, <laughs> apologies, apologies. So specifically addressing the question of spaceship Earth. So, you know, he's, he, it's phrased, honestly, I think that the phraseology used of spaceship Earth is used for almost for a sensational value. He wanted to phrase it in a particular manner to force us to sit up and pay attention. That's how I viewed it. Because he tell, what he's telling us is whether we like it or not, we are now the pilots of Spaceship Earth. I think he uses it saying that he's, he's talking about Earth itself. He uses the word Spaceship Earth. Maybe he's read um, Buckminster Fuller, perhaps. That's what came to mind for me personally. Um, you know, because Buck, Mr. Fuller is the one who is most renowned, or it could be maybe most renowned in our circles for using that phrase. Um, so I think that to focus on why he used the word spaceship is maybe not the key concept that I would encourage folks to focus upon. I would say, if you need to, if it's too distracting, take it out and consider the heaviness of the statement even without the word spaceship. Whether or not, what, um, I'm sorry, whether we like it or not, we are now the pilots of our earth. It's not as grabby as using the word spaceship, but the, the impact and the pause that it gives us is the same. Um, so those are just my thoughts. I think that he was going for a little bit of sensationalism when he used it. And um, unfortunately, I, I do hope that it doesn't detract from the deepness of the statement and the, the need, the real need to take that statement, write it down and ponder it. I really think that that's gonna come back though, Joe. I think, I don't know if he'll use the word spaceship again, but I do believe that that concept is going to be something that we'll see throughout the book. Thanks for sharing your thoughts there, Maritza. And I'll just remind everyone, so uh, I guess you, if you want to even connect this to Buckminster Fuller and Spaceship Earth, or just think about humans as piloting the Earth, as Maritza suggested. And the other part of Joe's question was even um, th this idea that we might need a new set of instructions, which was an idea that, that kind of, I think, came up throughout this chapter, that, uh, that we're going to have to go beyond whatever both what our uh, like what he referred to as our instincts, like what what evolution perhaps has given us those drives for let's say food, sex, reproduction, going beyond that, and even going beyond what he at one point called the kind of worldly wisdom, going beyond just the status quo values that we're going to need some new set of instructions, new set of values, new set of goals. So if anybody wants to share their thoughts about that part of Joe's question as well. And again, um, you can just raise your hand or type exclamation point in the chat. And it looks like uh, Laura has something to say here that she wants to share. Yeah, Laura, you can you. Oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. I'm all over the place. Um, now, I was, every time by the time I get called, I'm, uh, you know, hear other things, but, you know, spaceship, that time, for me, coming out of the 1960s, it just sounds like an LSD related type of thing, you know, uh, you know, some sort of wild story, that, you know, a story that we can be on that takes us outside of our realm of, re you know, reality into a new place, a new dimension. But anyway, that being said, um, no, but it's, um, I think the thing here is that it becomes, you know, evolution basically occurs in milliseconds. I guess it would be down to every, every, every second we breathe is, uh, is, is evolution, you know, in some sense. So, you know, to really capture in some kind of way, I mean, you can't be counting second by second and always having a new definition. So. There's got to be some way that we find to quantify that time, you know, that time and space where something is 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 grown or improved upon or uh, discovered. I mean, different things can happen during that evolutionary process too, because we haven't really talked about discovery 
we talked about, you know, sort of um, growing what we've got, you know, making it bigger, better, or whatever. But, you know, totally new discovery may be something else that we need to be talking about in this process. Um, but, um, yeah, I, it's, it's, this whole thing's pretty fascinating, I must admit. And I forgot why I had what I was going to say before relative to something else that was said, like I said. But I think that, um, it, um, the fact is just that, you know, I think in some ways, I don't think anybody ever like sits stagnantly and says, oh, this is fine with me. I don't care. I don't want any more out of life. Maybe there's some people who will do that when they reach a certain point in time and they're just tired and they don't feel like, you know, doing anything. Or maybe they, you know, their circumstances of their life has been such that they never felt that they had the ability to go off and think like that because they had to pay bills and they had to just do really concrete things, you know, and that's all they could do with their life. And that's all they've been doing. And that's what they'll continue to do. Whereas some other people have been lucky enough to be able to go off on a tangent and do things that have been, you know, fascinating, wonderful, and full of discovery that have, you know, rendered them richer, smarter, you know, people to do things. Um, so, you know, and they're, you know, <laughs> there's this whole thing that we deal with in our society, you know, it's like, I mean, I hate to say how it comes, but you know, they often talk about, you know, poverty breeds poverty. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different things in our society that function in that way. And it's, and those are things that, you know, why, why does that happen? You know, if it was just as easy as saying poverty, then we could remove poverty, but I don't think we would remove all the problems we have. But I think that that's um, part of the thing that we need to talk about in terms of. Oh. Oh. Awesome. Thanks a lot. I think um, you know, cutting out there, but um, uh, I just I think you're making a really great point too about um, you know bring this concept of discovery to our attention and, and thinking about how that even, uh, you know, fits in with our, our ideas of evolution here. Um, let me see. Next up, we have um, Wayne and then Joe. Yeah, Spaceship Earth is a, definitely a 60s term. I have fond memories of it, though. I was like young uh, in the 60s, uh, too young to be actually a hippie, unfortunately. But it kind of invokes that idea of we're all one, we're all united. Uh, it, we don't have one Earth. It's kind of in conjunction with the pale blue dot of seeing the earth for the first time from the moon. It just kind of indicated, hey, we just, we're one, we have all of our divisions we think are important, but we're still just one people, one planet. We have to figure out how to get along and, and keep going. And to Joe's questions, well, what would be our instruction? We had one set of instructions to get here. Now, what are the set of instructions we need to keep on going? And that's the good question. And I, I'm hoping he can answer that, uh, Arthur can answer the question because I'm not fully sure what the answers are other than we got to change something because we're headed for disaster with the ecology, uh, global warming and such, but I won't get on a soapbox there. I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time uh, to the person who asked the question, Joe. Oh, thanks for sharing, Lane. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in and say, yeah, I, I'm convinced that even if MC doesn't give us the best answers, he's going to give us a lot to think about and is going to give us uh, some really good questions to ponder so we can develop our own answers as well. But turning it over to Joe next. Did did you say you were turning it over to me? Oh, OK. All right. I, I, you cut out there for a moment. Um, I mean, the only thing I can come up with uh, and in as Wayne had already articulated, is that, you know, how do we move forward? Um, and since this is the evolving self, I think it gets to something that actually uh, Maritza had brought up in our, uh, in, in the introduction uh, with the idea of just moving forward with intention and actually taking a step back and understanding our values, um, you know, individually. And I think that that's a really important point a lot of people, you know, that we're moving beyond our immediate needs and they're actually thinking in a contemplative manner uh, how to move forward, both on a uh, from a global perspective, 
but as well as on an individual perspective uh, so that we're more mindful in, uh, in how we actually uh, handle ourselves. That would make sense if you're talking about the evolving self um, and the evolution of and the individual uh, and then how that relates to moving together, uh, you know, uh, as a, uh, as a, as a planet, um, then that, that, that takes on, it's kind of a interesting question and how you would address that per se. So I, I, again, I look forward to that answer. Me too. Maritza is up next and then Laura has something to add to, to, to her thoughts as well. So, so, I, you know, I just want to mention that, you know, in this, in this, right before he talks about spacious earth, he says something really profound. He says, and this is kind of maybe a premonition for what's to come for the rest of the book. He says, two cent statements. He says, the goals and values we now have are appropriate to a species blindly struggling along with other species in the stream of life. And he says, they are appropriate to passengers, not to navigators. So perhaps his idea of evolution is how do we evolve from being passengers to being navigators? And what I see here is again, this idea of we're floating along, letting the current take us as opposed to moving forward with intention, which, you know, it's one of my favorite words. So that's what I'm seeing that he's going to present to us as we move forward here together. Thanks, Maritza. I'm glad you brought up those those previous sentences. I, I love that, even thinking about how do we evolve from passenger to navigator. All right, Laura is going to be up next. Actually, um, Laura, um, let's um, can we allow um, Govert Schuler to speak? He had not spoken yet before, so and then we'll we'll let Laura go right after. Yeah. Awesome, thank you, Laura. Thanks, go ahead, Laura. Um, Govert. Uh, you're too kind because I was terribly late, and I'm um, I'm I'm weathering from a cold, so I'm not showing my cold face. <laughs> but um, the little thing I want to add is is um, so I, I I participated in a lot of Srikan's um, sessions about Nietzsche, and there is an evolutionary interpretation of what Nietzsche uh, meant uh, with his philosophy. And, and Nietzsche himself was very aware of Darwin. He, he had some, you know, chips on the shoulder about Darwin himself, but, but the evolutionary paradigm, he applied that to himself. And in the end, he's, he, he came to a position that the, the, let's say the pinnacle of evolution for mankind is something called self-selection. We select ourselves in the sense that we experiment randomly with different kinds of practices and sensitivities and language and this, that, and the other, and then try to figure out, you know, what's, what fits best. And if it's something that, that um, you know, others will pick up to, and that's part of evolution, then it will spread through the population. So coming back to... Um, MCs, and, and, and I'm very glad that you call him MC without having to say his full <laughs> name. Um, yes, if we go from being passengers on a spaceship to navigators, uh, it will be on the basis of self-selection and a process of consensus making about what the values will be and how far, and, and, and this is, a little bit different. I've studied um, a German sociologist about uh, civilizations, and he said there are two two things that can, that get civilizations going upwards: increased empathy and increased self control. But there are stages that we lose the empathy and lose the self control, and so you know, in the 30s and the 40s, Europe went through a terrible loss. <laughs> of empathy and self-control, but they regained it later again and said, oops, you know, that was really terrible. So um, we, we have to experiment with ourselves and especially at the level of empathy and how far we want empathy to go. Uh, so if we're talking about our own species, others are saying like, no, 
there are other species to which we have to extend our empathy and 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 you know the earth itself is something of a living being and to that we also have to extend our our empathy which means we need to get to a level of self control so that other species can live and that the that the earth can you know be a viable healthy um entity in which we are you know part and parcel so that's my that's my riff uh, uh going back to uh nietzsche and and i don't know where Srikant is but i hope he would have liked it <laughs> thank you well wow. thank you govert Srikant's not here unfortunately but i i like your riff and i'm, I'm glad you connected it to the, the nietzsche discussions as well thank you for for that all right laura how I, was I, oh, I, Hey, one one quick second, if I can just comment on what Gover and I, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong. So Gover, the um, I find it fascinating. So Nietzsche is, you know, the the whole self sufficiency concept. I see aspects that could maybe align with some of these evolutionary aspects that we're discussing, but an interesting thing is that early on in this first chapter, we already see that MC is laying the foundation for. Um, stating that the path towards the evolving self lies within the self within the community, not the self standing alone. I would garner that perhaps that would diverge from some of Nietzsche's um, beliefs. But um, so I hope that you join us for future chapters. And I would love to hear some of your commentary on that aspect um, of how it might um, work or not work with um, Nietzsche's concept. Just something I want to throw out there. Uh, thank you, Joya. No, agreed. And and, and I just wanna reiterate the idea too that I, I think it's wonderful at this point in 52 Living Ideas, Sri Khan's got so many different communities and so many different series on. And it's wonderful when we have people coming who've come from the other series. And I, I, I always think it's fascinating when people are able to make the connections between all the ideas. I see it's how part of how we all come together and, and grow and learn together. So the more people want to bring in insights from other meetups they've attended, I that's just, I think, adds to our, our conversation here. But uh, Laura wanted to say something, uh, continue her thoughts next. Okay, um, I was just thinking about the concept. Um, we might, you know, there's some point that we have examples of evolved, you know, societies or whatever. And perhaps at some point we have you know, kind of a place where we can we can look to see very what societies look like. So if we want to direct the evolution of our society, we have the ability to do that to a certain extent because we create our leaders, right? So our leaders come out of our evolved society and we develop our leaders and we can use these examples of societies that are most aligned to our and we can and look where they went and maybe now we can do that with ours. So I think it gets more more complicated and in depth because there are so many levels, and we're just not starting out with okay, here we got to this point. We're just this clean, you know, we're one group only, and then, and that's we have to be careful about that because we're multiple groups with multiple you know diversities and and all kinds of things that variations that will occur that will change um, the nature of our of a, our evolved society, and you know. In some cases, something will be an asset. In some other cases, it may be a deficit. We don't know what until we act it out. You know, it's almost like a play. We have to act out and look at all the characters and see if they all work together. You know, and then we may have to make an adjustment here and there, and we can fine tune things. But unfortunately, I also don't think it goes like that. I think it's you know, it's just, there's nobody out there who's helping us to define these things and to evaluate these things. So the process is a little more complicated yet, but that's just my, another two cents I had. I hate those pennies, you know, I got kids getting rid of them. <laughs> Thanks for giving us your, your pennies of thought there, then Laura. So we, we are getting to the end of the time. So I do just want to make sure we had one more question. I, I even wanted to see something here about the last question too, and then make sure we have time to wrap up and, and get you on to the next meetup as well. But so the next question was this, um, 
a question about was there some kind of element of um, eugenics perhaps? And th this one actually struck me because I, I even heard, like I, this was one of the things that kind of bothered me personally. And it was right here toward the very end of the book. And so I'll just read you this, this section of the book that this was something that definitely stood out to me where, um, so, so he's making the point that uh, he says here, certainly there are many momentous tasks looming ahead in these perilous times from saving the rainforest to protecting the ozone layer and then reducing the number of births to keeping those already born from tearing each other to pieces. And, and that really struck me, like, like, do we need to reduce the number of births um, in order to evolve as a species? I, I would say that that definitely goes against some of my own convictions and thoughts of even how progress happens. I, I think it's amazing that uh, that we've learned that the whole, I, I believe the Malthusian viewpoint is wrong, that what is, we, we even though obviously as living beings, we need uh, you know, resources from the environment in order to survive. What we see is that human beings have this amazing capacity to create resources. And we have more people on this planet than we have ever had ever yet throughout the history of evolution. And it seems that what we need is more people coming up, being problem solvers, being entrepreneurs, coming up with the resources that allow us to have to have more people and then even just the possibilities to now you know travel out into space both to have more resources and to you know support living beings perhaps throughout the the far flung galaxies so that, that was definitely something that that stood out to me but uh, if anybody else wants to comment on that question Joe did you have something you wanted to say there I just say really quickly, I mean, it is interesting to it counters the Malthusian economic approach to the world that, you know, and that we can actually do more with less resources. However, we have to look at it from um, a perspective of our values and how we're actually going to treat the earth if we're going to increase the population and the percentage of living species on the earth, in, within the earth. So in other words, if we can't just continue to exploit it, so one example would be something like water and its resources. Uh, so water resources are, you know, they're, they're limited and then the more we consume something like meat or something along those lines, if people eat like Americans do, that it would really not be a sustainable way of living going forward. Um, so that's something that's interesting as well. So I, I kind of see where there's just this balancing of like kind of what is the future really going to look like? You know, is this sustainable? Uh, and we need to ask those questions. And I think that that's kind of where he was talking a little bit, we're getting back to the idea of spaceship Earth as well. Um, so uh, how do we see ourselves living within as, as part of a ecosystem? you know, as part of a greater whole, so that something is not, you know, we're, we're not necessarily destroying ourselves in the process. And that's realigning our values as well. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I, I do think that, yes, while more people, and, you know, it, it's, it's a possibility, but it's also, like anything else, there's also, there's positives and negatives to it, so. If I can um, just uh, make a quick comment on this, you know, he, he points out, he points to those examples as saying that they are um, an example of a few of the momentous tasks looming ahead for us humans. And he says that they're not more essential than, you know, find a way to develop selves that will support evolution. So I, I think he, he labels them as like secondary or tertiary concerns. Um, and I mean, I don't know where his, you know, um, thinkings lie on these, but um, to me, I, I think that he's just saying these are, these are out there floating around, but they're secondary, tertiary. The most essential is this other thing. So um, I do, um, I mean, that's, that's the way I viewed it. I, I don't know for a fact whether or not we're going to get further into eugenics. Personally, I hope not. That's my two cents. All right, Anton has the, the last comment here of the day and then we're gonna close up for this evening, Anton. 
Wow. I don't know if it deserves to be the last comment, but it's going to be the last comment. <laughs> so uh, actually, Joe did a great job at summing up a lot of what my thoughts were, because I did that exact quote that you read, Joya, was I did think, hmm, that's a strange thing. The part where he was talking about the population, I was like, well, what does he mean by that? And I could have a very like cynical view of what that means. But uh, but yeah, I mean, there's we obviously can't just <laughs> endlessly keep producing people and also be able to be balanced uh, with our resources with what we're doing. So I think Joe did a good, good job at summing that up. Um, and I'm glad that you, uh, on a lighter note, I'm glad you guys are continuing this flow series, uh, by the way. So that's what I have to say. Uh, thank you, Anton. That, that even perfectly sets us up for uh, uh, transitioning out. So, so you guys know, so the next session here in our flow series, it's going to be two weeks from today. We start at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So hopefully you'll be able to join us again Thursdays at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, Chapter two of this book is called Who or I want to make sure I get it exactly right. Yeah, it's Who Who Controls the Mind. So unfortunately, it looks like we're not going to get uh, much of a deeper discussion into evolution quite yet. But I think we are going to learn a lot more details of MC's view of what consciousness entails. So I think it's going to be a really fascinating chapter. And so uh, hopefully, you can all join us again two weeks from today. And I'll just uh, turn it to Maritza with any last thoughts for the evening. I'm just going to um, give you a question because why not? Um, and this is not my question. This is MC's question. What is the central organizing principle of yourself? Thanks guys, see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks, everybody. One more time, the question, please. Oh, yeah, can you read the question one more time? Oh, apologies, yes. So this is from, so just for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to get to the book, um, MC actually poses some questions at the end that are sit down and meditate questions. So I'm throwing one back at you. He says, what is the central organizing principle of yourself? And he actually says a little bit more because he goes on, he says, is it fame or fortune? Is it the desire to be loved or to be feared, to be envied or to be thanked? What is it that you could not lose without losing your sense of self? So maybe I'll even ponder that and we can uh, add that to our thoughts for next time. Thanks for the extra notes. I needed some clues. <laughs> 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 and then where do I get the book? I'm sure it's probably on oh, and yes. And so the book, yeah. And um, there is an audio version even available yeah, for this book. Right. I have an older copy. <laughs> Maritza has a paperback. So yeah, hopefully yeah. you can find a copy of uh, The Evolving Self. Yeah, I, there is, DLJ um, actually had the answer to the question too. So oh, DLJ <laughs> had an answer? Yeah, no, the answer, I think. So. The answer, yeah. we've got two seconds. What do you say? Oh, my wife. <laughs> my wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good answer, Over DLJ. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, have a good evening, everyone. See you later, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs> have a great one. <laughs>